So I'll tell you about five years ago, I was a co-chief of, you know, emergency and trauma services at the Himalayan Institute. It's in uh, Jolly Grant, Dehradun. <clears throat> I was co-chiefing it with the uh, head of surgery. So we used to get a lot of polytrauma there. And the entire bulk of that trauma team comprised of uh, general surgery SRs. SRs and final years. We used to be the team leaders. So there was a polytraumatized victim. He, brought, he was brought in sort of a peri-arrest situation. You know, the ones who are like really moribund and in a few minutes they crash. That kind of a situation. So the team was assembled, all ready to go. He arrested and we started CPR. And there were three surgeons at the caudal end of the patient. Caudal end, okay? The tail end. And one of them was doing a digital rectal examination. Now when questioned, why was a digital rectal examination being done during CPR? The answer was, we are checking for a high riding prostate. The answer is not wrong, right? What is being done is not wrong. When it's being done, that is the problem here. So, you know, we call that black humor on the field where, you know, you just have this deadpan look. What did you do? High riding prostate. So you'll be like, okay, you know, what is the essence of this talk that we're going to have is that the science is the same universally, but it's integrating the science in a structured approach, paying regard to time. That is of the essence over here. All right. So on that note, uh, uh, just a brief introduction. Uh, I'm a senior consultant uh, in emergency medicine at uh, Nanavati Max. Uh, I used to be the co-chief at Himalayan Institute. Uh, the reason I'm mentioning that here is because uh, that gave me a lot of sort of information and resources to prepare this talk uh, for you guys uh, uh, today. The topic is the crux of ATLS. So just so that I have a disclaimer out there, the crux is the decisive or most important part of the issue. I am not going to talk to you all about advanced trauma life support. I'm going to talk to you all about the crux of it. Okay. To tell you about advanced trauma life support requires three days, right? So that's not what you're here to gain, but I intend to give you all the philosophy, the ideology behind it so that that is what you can take out of this. I believe the theme of this course is uh, simplifying the complexity. So my intention is to try and simplify the philosophy of ATLS for you guys. Okay, so if that happens, then, then this has been a success. I'm going to just run three images, okay? Y'all will need to answer. If y'all don't answer, then this talk is going to come to an end, right? Now just look at the image. This is a brief scenario I'm giving you. That 35 year old man, blast injury. It's an isolated traumatized limb, right? The heart rate's 140. Pressure is not recordable. He's breathing at 30. Saturation is 96% on room air. You all can read those vital parameters, right? I'm not going to say all of it. What do you do as an orthopedic surgeon? The answer has to be quick. Yeah, I'm also on the clock. Just tell me what you do. Okay, do you think this guy's airway is patent? I have not actually given you a lot of information, so that's on me. But but there is something very ominous that's going on there. Yeah. Why do you think that's happening? Could be. I mean, I have just given you two pointers there. I have told you that he's got no recordable blood pressure. The only assumption could be that he's hypoperfused because of shock which could gradually mean he's getting obtunded. Why have I put this here is that the limb is mangled. That is a distracting injury, right? But we still got to do something else first, which is what the ATLS is going to tell us, which is what I'm going to tell you. But the thought process here is that a polytraumatized victim will present with distracting injuries as an orthopedic surgeon, the distraction is going to take front stage. Rest assured, it will. 
ओके नेक्स्ट ट्वेंटी सिक्स मेल हाई इम्पैक्ट ट्रॉमा टू द फेस अगेन इट्स एन आइसोलेटेड इंजरी दीज आर द वाइटल पैरामीटर्स वॉट नीड्स टू बी डन आई हैव गिवन यू स्टेबल वाइटल पैरामीटर्स If there was the first thing that you had to look after, okay. So I'm telling you, his GCS is E3 V5 M6, which means he's actually talking. There would not be an issue with the airway based on what I'm telling you, but there's something else. The clincher here is a high impact injury to the face, and there's something which has not been protected. so we are going to come come to that again okay the situation here is a potential injury to the cervical spine so i am giving you high impact i am giving you face high impact or a high velocity injury so somebody's cervical spine has been left free there whatever you may want to do is absolutely fine but you need to anticipate the fact that the cervical spine could be injured so again a distracting injury image 3 Thirty-eight female thermal inhalation burns. You all have the parameters there. What do you think needs to be done, or rather should be anticipated? Potential potential airway threat. I have given a downtime of three hours there, so that that edema is only going to rise. It's an inhalation injury. So why have I given you these three images? I have given you these three images to show you that. complex trauma can present in any form when you are in that kind of a situation two things will happen either your mind will shut down completely or you know you'll just be so good at it like a natural and you'll just be moving all over the place now let us assume that the latter is just a a small percentage of people most people their minds will shut down but when your mind shuts down you will resort to training and instinct the point of advanced trauma life support is to train you with prerequisite skills so in such a situation you just fall back to your training it is an algorithm it is a protocol it is a set pattern it's set in stone if you follow that pattern the patient does not die you don't follow that pattern the patient dies that is what the moral of that story is all right okay so what is the concept treat the greatest threat to life first the lack of a definitive diagnosis should never impede the application of an indicated treatment before atls was created even in the us uh, in the er's polytrauma was being seen by residents by by undergrads so a lot of these victims were being received and undergrads and residents only know one way of taking the history and that history is as per you know yeah what hutchison used to teach us what harrison used to teach us that kind of thing so it's immaterial of that it's not based on the background it's got nothing to do with the history actually except the mechanism of injury of course okay a detailed history is not essential to begin evaluation and treatment understand this concept okay because it's very important for all of you people a lot of time is wasted on getting the nitty gritties of the case rather than what the case in front of you is okay no doubt you may want to know if the person is on anticoagulation i get you i'm with you but that is not all that's going to take front stage assessment has to be rapid and prompt okay everything comes later we'll come to that in in a while All right. Anybody is familiar? I don't think anybody is actually familiar with the actual history, right, of ATLS. I just thought I'll I'll just tell you all a bit about it, so it'll put things into perspective. You all know who actually fathomed the concept of ATLS? He yeah, is an orthopedic surgeon, right? The concept has come from him, right? Uh, uh, you know, you remember his name? James Steiner. Yeah, yeah. So, so in in seventy six. So, so this story is all over. It's even there in the ATLS manual as a as a preface. You know, in seventy six, James Steiner, a, a quite a well known established orthopedic surgeon in the US. So, so he was with his family flying. Uh, he was flying on his own. It was a light light aircraft, and in Nebraska, he crashed. So he had four children. 
three of them were sort of badly injured one was mortally wounded wife died at the site now nebraska is a relatively rural part of the us so they were taken to like a nearby regional hospital and he witnessed a kind of care that stunned him so for years he went on preaching about how trauma should be managed how it's a time dependent thing and we need to do something about it and then ultimately one of his dear friends dr ronald craig he was a family medicine specialist a general practitioner he told him enough of this screaming why don't you do something substantial so one night over dinner they sat down and he actually wrote the basic protocols of what would then become the atls course believe you me this was designed for general practitioners in fact when they first made it they approached the american academy of family physicians back then but the academy rejected that course saying that it was not robust enough family physicians and then finally in the early 80s and in fact in 1980 is when the american college of surgeons back then dr paul collicott who was the chairman of the committee on trauma he's the one who recognized the potential of this and he said okay let the surgeons take care of this so the american college of surgeons came in and in 1980 the first course was run in detroit bulk of the uh, participants were family physicians so this course has been designed not for a person who is dealing with trauma day in and day out it is actually designed for people who are not dealing with poly trauma day in and day out that is where the essence lies right because it comes from pre hospital care and it comes from military medicine combat medicine that's where it comes from right <laughs> what are the goals rapid accurate assessment resuscitate according to priority determine your resource capabilities arrange appropriate and safe transfer and ensure optimal care these are the goals of atls okay this is what basically summarizes its concept in what has to be done what is your understanding of the term golden hour i'm certain that every single orthopedic person here knows about the golden hour so what is it what is your understanding of it okay you see in in here there is its word play it's not actual time okay it's a window of opportunity so what i'm trying to say is that i agree that the maximum morbidity will probably happen in the first 3 hours okay but for you the golden hour is the window of opportunity your clock starts the moment the patient is with you this is important to know because a lot of time is lost in assessing a patient rather than resuscitating a patient so if you understand that there is a window of opportunity you will know to start assessing immediately this will only happen if you know the concepts and that is what atls wants to teach you those concepts right this is a very very overused graph i have only put it here because of historical significance the trimodal death distribution which is what i was talking about uh, three peaks of death following a uh, uh, trauma the first will be immediately at the scene at the site so what can that involve spinal cord brain stem aorta heart so that's instantaneous death there is nothing anybody can do about that and then you have the one that comes weeks later because of complications whatever it may be rhabdomyolysis leading to acute kidney injury sepsis jo bhi hai atls comes in the second peak in the middle right 0 to 3 hours or 1 to 3 hours because that is the time it takes for any poly traumatized victim who's alive to reach you if they reach you and they are alive atls has to kick in if you don't then the question does the morbidity and mortality increase this is all something we have to talk about does it actually increase right but understand this trimodal distribution if you can it is a window of opportunity assessing a poly trauma or a poly traumatized victim has to be immediate the approach this is the the bulk of it what is your understanding of a vertical or a horizontal approach we had a mention about trauma teams 
if you have a team let us say five members logically speaking how do you think you will approach your patient vertically or horizontally by vertical i mean a b c d e by horizontal i mean a b c d e is happening simultaneously so if you have a trauma team what approach would logically happen horizontal if you have a trauma team your approach is horizontal everything is happening simultaneously because there is delegation there is allocation of role responsibility most people don't have the luxury of a trauma team so if if we are talking atls to people who are not exposed to a lot of poly trauma then obviously we are talking about atls to a person who doesn't have the luxury of a trauma team so hence they talk about a b c d e this is vertical this is from top to bottom which can be done by one person in theory it can so you have to assume that you are alone with a poly traumatized victim if this person has to survive or live you need to do a vertical approach which is what atls wants to teach you they do have the roles of atls in a trauma team and team dynamics and all of that but you need to understand something very simple a vertical approach will ensure your patient does not die in front of you why is that so there we come to the primary survey what is the primary survey we say a b c d e what is this a b c d e that also i think everybody knows airway breathing circulation neurological disability exposure environmental whatever it may be why do you think that is why must we follow that why must we follow that approach why do you think we should follow that approach does it make any sense to you as an orthopedic surgeon following that approach you could tell me that the first case the first image i showed you that guy obviously has come in like a class 4 hemorrhagic shock he's got hemorrhagic shock i have given you a mangled limb so you can argue and say right the problem is hemorrhage control the hemorrhage take care of the bleeding the guy will live why is that argument not coming forward do you all think does that make sense does that make sense why but because deterioration happens exponentially in a cascade that is airway breathing circulation for example a compromised airway gives you only minutes to live dysfunctional breathing will probably give you maybe half an hour maybe an hour more circulatory disability will probably kill you much later a brain lesion an edh or an sdh might take a few more hours to actually kill you these are all killers don't get me wrong they are all killers but i am talking about the time taken for example if there is a big blood clot that is blocking my laryngeal aperture that is not going to give me much time before there is asphyxiation and death the same patient could have a shaft of femur right i could give you the same patient with a shaft of femur and you'll tell me 2 liters have gone at the time of injury and he has come to us 3 hours later that's the cause of his shock so let us stabilize the femur let us give him blood he will live but if the same person has a blood clot in the upper airway the asphyxiation will kill him before the shock so addressing airway before breathing breathing before circulation is a part of a proven dynamic it works it's done mainly in combat medicine it's done on the field most of the studies proving that this works is done in combat medicine but there is no evidence saying that we have to think anything else if done in civilians right so it works what is a secondary survey head to toe examination okay head to toe examination that's pretty self explanatory so i'm not going to get into that but what is tertiary survey tertiary survey is a concept utilized specifically in the poly traumatized victim or in trauma this is to catch missed injuries when there is devastating trauma mark my words all your focus will go on the obvious injuries the mangled limb the deformity but there will be something subtle which will be mixed which will be missed 
you yourselves might have encountered this n number of times if there is a grade 3 compound fracture of the radius ulna mangled okay you will miss a closed fracture of the tip of terminal phalanx of the grade 2 it will happen now how do you prevent that is by doing a tertiary survey so the tertiary survey comes after the primary and secondary survey so to put things into perspective you start your primary survey the moment the patient is brought to you you're alone you do a vertical approach airway first if there is a problem open up the airway how do you do that relieve the obstruction i'm not going to tell you how to do that because that is what the course is for but i'm just giving you the principle relieve the obstruction go down to breathing is there an issue with breathing oh there is a tension pneumothorax tackle it tackle it before moving on to the circulatory component it's not like you do the primary survey and you come and say i did a primary survey there was airway compromise there was a tension pneumothorax i then went on to circulation i found he had no pulse no you deal with it when you encounter it that is what atls will teach you right tertiary survey happens after your secondary survey after you have reassessed your patient and you now know your patient is safe once your patient is safe you will do a tertiary survey at your leisure so whatever things you have missed you will then not miss and how i like to do a tertiary survey is that you could probably take one of your residents with a piece of paper on a on a clipboard and then you start dictating the injuries it's all injuries superficial even if it's an abrasion it's made a mention of the exact site it's written and then similarly you do a log roll protecting the cervical spine and then you go posteriorly as well everything has to be marked tertiary survey from an orthopedic surgeon i genuinely feel tertiary survey is something which you all should incorporate in any kind of traumas that you all are seeing okay multiple limbs you all will miss so this is the last slide basically i i wanted to put one thing over here now that i have given the philosophy what do you think is the impact of atls do you think it works this was one study i found which i liked because it's sort of like a systematic review okay it's conducted uh, i think in abu dhabi yeah, i think in abu dhabi uh, in uae somewhere but they've done a systematic review over 30 uh, three decades what is the educational impact of atls do you think it's a good educational tool so it's proven to be a good educational tool so for example teaching you a structured approach and skills is known to work in the classroom which means if you learn atls today you will retain that knowledge really well for a few months maybe 5 or 6 months if you don't indulge yourself in any kind of trauma practice probably 2 years that knowledge will remain but after 2 years it's going to start fading but educational value is there because it will teach you a concept it will improve your skill set but what does it actually improve survival morbidity mortality what do you think the reason that this cannot be answered holistically is because this cannot be studied holistically it can never be studied holistically to have a large cohort study it will be over different demographics different situations i mean we are following an american system obviously the europeans also are coming up with their own system but it can never be studied in real time so we don't know as a fact if it's going to improve morbidity and mortality but it will improve the optimal care that as a clinician a surgical clinician you want to achieve all right